ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبد ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله today we will be concluding sura maryam uh, and we had last week reached ayah number 87 where allah subhanahu wa taala is talking about the concept of shifa intercession shifa is for someone putting a good word for you or giving a recommendation and on the day of judgment allah will be the only authority so the inter- intercession will be for people uh, who allah have already decided that they will be forgiven but he is going to allow shifa for those people in order to give honor to those who are uh, allowed to make intercession that's the whole idea um this uh, there is very serious misunderstanding of shafa that uh, can even lead to disbelief and shirk with allah subhanahu wa taala how does that happen uh, it's mentioned in the next ayah wa qalu takhadha ar-rahman walada and they say the most merciful has taken for himself a son so um wa qalu and they said this is referring back to the disbelievers now this is stated in a very general term because it's addressing all the disbelievers it's talking about the yahud it's talking about christians and it's also talking about the mushrikun walad uh, though the translation that you are seeing is son uh which is like a modern translation of uh, of uh, walad in arabic language but in classical arab uh, arabic language it means a child so anybody who makes an in- inappropriate comment about allah is included in this somebody thinks that angels are daughters of allah or somebody thinks like you know a human being is a son of allah in either cases uh you know this particular ayah is referring to that person ayah number 89 laqad ji'tum shay'an idda now uh you have done an atrocious thing you have done an atrocious thing allah is reprimanding the disbelievers and there are actually two things to understand in this ayah number one this word that's coming idda or iddan is something that is very inappropriate it is an act that kind of induces response from people like you know when someone would for example would just unmute yourself and start yelling in the class and you might be yelling on your maid or your children but what's going to happen what's going to happen what kind of reaction will that trigger in the class there'll be a huge reaction um i might just like be thrown off uh, the mentors might just like immediately try and get in touch with you and ask you to please mute yourself isn't that so this is the meaning of the word idda when something really atrocious happens and everybody startled and there is a reaction coming from people that's idda acha now that's one thing the second thing is that allah subhanahu wa taala was talking about disbelievers in the third person in the previous ayah wa qalu wa qalu takhadha rahman walada and they say the most merciful has taken for himself a son third person but what's happening in this ayah all of a sudden allah subhanahu wa taala changes from third person to first person and he says you have done an atrocious thing so allah subhanahu wa taala was originally addressing these disbelievers in third person because you know there is a kind of uh, you know a, a tinge of eloquence when you're upset with somebody you're angry with somebody and you're not addressing them directly we w- women do that quite a lot so you know you you're so angry that you don't even want to look at that person you're so angry that you don't want to speak directly to that person right but 
when elaborating on what they have done that's so bad, the tone becomes so severe, reprimand becomes so direct that at that time, you just turn to that person, point to them and say, how dare you do that? How could you? Now you're not going to beat around the bush by talking about them as if they don't exist. You don't use third person anymore because you're really, really angry and you just give it to them. So sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that to show his severe anger. So there are tones, you know, of uh, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses uh, the disbelievers. And we have to kind of gauge on what kind of tone Allah is using. The heavens almost rupture therefore, therefrom, therefrom, and the earth splits up open, and the mountains collapse in devastation. So what does it mean that you people are saying something which is so bad, it is so severe that it's causing a riot among the creation, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are appalled, they are infuriated, and so much so that Ibn Abbas, he said that all the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, all of them, they feel fearful of committing shirk. Um, they're appalled, they're infuriated, you know, at shirk. And there's just like one creation that has the obliviousness, that have the audacity, was stupid enough to do shirk. And who are they? Us human beings. In Surah Teen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say about humans? That they can be the best of best and they can be the worst of the worst. We have created, certainly created man in the best of stature. And then we return him to the lowest of the low. So the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they can't stand the fact that human, the human beings do shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The skies are uh, very close to just rip apart due to the shirk that's been done. The earth will open and just swallow um, you hear me loud and clear? Uh, yes, I will just wait for your message if you feel that my voice is breaking up. All right. So the earth uh, would open and swallow everything, you know, that's upon, its, uh, upon it. Why? Out of fury of the shirk human is doing. Achha. The mountains collapse in devastation. This word hadda is very important to understand. This is when something that's really, really huge, massive, it falls and it falls so hard that it just kind of shakes the ground, right? So like, you know, a good example is like huge building. It demolishes. And what happens when it, it demolishes, it shakes the ground around it as well. And when it, when it falls, you see dust rising you know, as if there has been an explosion. So the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, they are so angry, so infuriated. This is almost like mountains and heavens and the sky and the earth are people with feelings. And they are angry with man because he is wasting Allah's blessing. What blessing is man wasting? He's been blessed with becoming a vicegerent in this dunya. Sky is basically what? Protective ceiling. Isn't that so? It says we want to protect you anymore. Earth has been put to service. Uh, Earth has been put to surface, a service for the human beings. Mountains are what? They're like pegs. Uh, they make sure that the earth doesn't shift around. Isn't that so? So the creation. And they are so disgusted to serve these human beings who disrespect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the question is that there is shirk going on all around right now as we speak. Isn't that so? But do we see sky ripping, you know, sky ripping open or the earth splitting open? No. Why? Because... <coughs> 
this creation <coughs> they're so obedient to allah subhanahu ta'ala that they ask allah's permission before trying to destroy and demolish and crush humans and what does allah say no not as yet and guess what they obey allah they obey allah uh, unlike us human beings ayat number 91 uh rahmani walada they that they attribute to the most merciful a son or a child why am i saying child because the word walad in in classical arabic language is used for son and daughter both it can be child so why are these creations so angry at humans because they attributed to a rahman a son not to anybody else a rahman a rahman is so merciful and yet humans still associate others to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how could they i number 92 and it is not appropriate for the most merciful that he should take a son why why isn't it appropriate for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's a rahman to take a son because a need for a child it comes from wanting some some type of support system some some type of emotional moral companion companionship that you want you know like zakaria he made dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what did he say he said oh allah do not leave me alone he was literally lonely he wanted a child but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond those needs people worry you know who's going to inherit all of this from me well, Zakaria Salam, he also said Yarithuni, he inherits from me he wanted someone to inherit from him carry on the legacy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is way beyond all these needs Zakaria Salam, what did he say he said my head is going gray bones falling apart I need the child Allah so we all need children at old age for our you know some form of financial or physical or moral support but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-sufficient this is the reason why it's not in it's so inappropriate to associate anybody as a child of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I am 93 uh in kullu man fis samawati wal ardi illa aati rahmani abada there is no one in the heavens and the earth but that he comes to the most merciful as a servant now so they won't just come to a rahman but they will come as abadan as slaves all of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now there are people who live their lives realizing that they are slaves of allah they enslave themselves to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are going to come willingly because they live their lives being slave of allah they will be pleased to present themselves as slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then there are some who did not live with that mindset, but they still have to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as his slaves. So isn't it best to do it in this dunya? Because it will just make it easier for us on the day of judgment. Basic common sense. Ayah number 94, Laqad asa Asahu, sorry, Lakad Asahum Wa Hum Adda. He has enumerated them and counted them a full counting. Hmm? Acha. Now, um, what does it mean? That no doubt he has fully rounded them up. Asa is to take fully into account, not just count them and have a roster with their names but even to put their names in the sequence in whatever way allah wishes to so each and every little thing about them will be accounted you know they are allah SWT is counting each and everything um ayah number 95 and all of them are coming to him on the day of resurrection uh, alone Achha. now this can be talking about the disbelievers because it's been talking about them all along in this passage in ayah 8 it talks about you know how the disbelievers are going to come alone and believers are going to come in groups remember but also at each level they will be you know broken from from their groups uh and made to stand before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone 
even the good guys, the believers, at some point in time, they will be detached from their groups and they will be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This is another opinion. So, and it is based on the hadith, which we all have heard that the feet of Adam will not move until they've asked um, about four questions, four things, how he spent his life, uh, how did he use his youth, where he earned and where he spent. And the fourth question is how much of his knowledge he actually practiced. So there are two ways of understanding this particular uh, ayah. It can be for the disbelievers and it can be for good, uh, for, for both the good and the bad people, right? And after this, in the conclusive ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends this surah talking about people who will be protected from what is mentioned up till now. And this is like a beautiful ayah. This is like... Um, I just love this ayah. Indeed, those who have believed and done righteous deeds, the most merciful will appoint for them affection. Beautiful ayah. And there's so much, so much a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming from, for us in this particular ayah. Now, as I was telling you, this IN 96 is extremely powerful, uh, very powerful from a lot of perspective. First of all, let's just understand. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Sayyaj alu lahum ar-Rahmanu wudda. Very soon, a Rahman would reserve for them wudda. Unconditional, unparalleled love is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising. What is it? And that's the beauty of it. Uh, Vadud, we all know, is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That comes from the same root that Vud comes from. And Vadud is one whose love can't be matched by anybody. It cannot be matched with anything. That is Vadud. So people who believe and, and try to do their best Allah will very soon make for them unconditional love. Acha. Now, where is this love going to come from? What kind of love is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promising here? Because it's not specified in this ayah. It is, uh, is it Allah's love? Is it people's love? Or is it the love of other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the angels and mountains and oceans, etc.? Well, it's open-ended. Uh, meaning all of the above. That's amazing, amazing promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First and more foremost, they will receive Allah's love and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, just keep in mind, when was this ayah revealed? This surah revealed in the fifth year of prophethood. Let's not forget that. Um, and, uh, and he's been told that, you know, you keep doing what you're doing and you will receive love in ways that you couldn't possibly imagine. That's the promise, first and foremost, for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, for any anybody, anybody else who has the Iman on who, and he does righteous deeds. And as far as Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is concerned, Isra wal Miraj is a manifestation of Allah's love for him. He received such honor, such dignity, such love from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He received such nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that no other uh, creation of Allah has ever received, not even the angels. Why am I saying that? Not even the angels. Because we come to know from a narration that Jibreel, he reached the boundary at Sidr Sidratul Muntaha and he told Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that between me and Allah, there are 70,000 barriers of nur between Allah and Jibreel alayhi salam. How many barriers are there? 70,000 barriers. And he said that if I were to go near, near those barriers, I would just catch fire and literally disintegrate it. But you have been given the honor and distinction to go beyond this point, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did fulfill his promise uh, uh, to, uh, that he made to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Even in Surah Najm, uh, uh, we come to know about it. Come, come to know about it. Where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Asumma dana fatadalla 
wakana qaba qausaini aw adna they then he approached and descended so he was the measure of two bows or closer still allah here is explaining what kind of a beautiful private intimate moment it was between allah and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam how close they were together there's a lot of discussion about what exactly it means how close uh, but you know the idea is that it was a very very intimate moment where you just want to keep it to yourself this is our intimate it was so the love other people are going to receive is the love of allah first and foremost like for just like uh, for the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then what else what other love is allah subhanahu wa taala talking about there's again a hadith where uh, allah tells jibril that he loves a particular person and he says you love him so you love him also and then jibril tells the other angels and angels uh, they tell the various creation you know to love that person so much so that in the end everything and everyone loves this person right why because allah loves him the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had such love such acceptance from all the creation of allah subhanahu wa taala prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would there's an incident where he would lean against a, a tree stump when giving a khutbah and when he uh, moved away the tree stump cried animals would come to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for love uh, the prophet was making wudu once uh, from a bowl of water and a random cat cat just walked uh, up to the prophet and prophet tipped the bowl uh, to let the cat drink from the water and then he just continued making wudu with the same water clouds would provide shade over his head all of this is mentioned in various ahadith trees would say salam rocks would say salam to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam everyone and everything was drawn towards prophet and that same love is provided to those who have iman and who the, and, and the ones who do righteous deeds now this is the final time in the surah that ar rahman is mentioned this is the last time and you kind of almost at least i felt this you know a little bit of separation anxiety with ar rahman as if you know uh, <laughs> you won't have access to allah's rahma after finishing the surah uh but of course allah's attributes are uh, not finite and they are never ending alhamdulillah summa alhamdulillah and you can always keep going back to this surah to understand how beautifully uh, this attribute of allah subhanahu wa taala is explained through various narrations but yes ar rahman is mentioned here more than in any other surah of the quran and some classical mufassiruns out of affection they would refer to this surah as surah of rahma they used to call surah maryam surah of rahma so this surah began by mentioning allah's mercy and now it's ending here by mentioning allah's mercy and at the same time even when it's reprimanding people who did shirk with allah subhanahu wa taala even there it mentions the attribute of ar rahman and this is again for us to understand it is there is a very important lesson for us that yes allah is ar rahman but some people they just took things too far for example the christians it was the same delusion to allah subhanahu wa taala's mercy that led them astray because they said mm -hmm. his son was sacrificed as expiation for the sins so this is again a, a misinterpretation of allah being ar rahman even the jews what did they say we won't be tested uh, by fire except for a few days we are the children of god and we are his beloved ones mushrikun what did they say they said oh we want the mercy we, we want the mercy of allah subhanahu wa taala but we are so much in awe of him we don't find ourselves worthy of approaching allah directly so that's why we have representatives uh, you know on our behalf those idols those gods small gods this is how they justified it they also kind of uh, were had the notion of allah being a rahman but it was a, a wrong notion in the middle of the passage 
uh, that talks about horrific punishments Allah mentions are Rahman. Now, <laughs> we can understand at other places, but what does punishment have to do with Ar Rahman? Why is it mentioned in the same sentence? Well, it is from the mercy of Allah that he mentions his punishment. The punishment in and of itself on the day of judgment would not be the mercy, but mentioning that punishment today to us is surely uh, Allah's mercy. Um, because um, just imagine if this concept was left as a mystery, you know, something bad is going to happen and not giving us the detail that would have invited even more disobedience from people that would have invited even more confusion and misconceptions, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid it out beautifully and completely, even the consequences of committing a sin. That is Rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like, you know, um, you're given a test paper and then you are given a week to study for it. You get the test paper first and then you get a week to study for it. How easy is that? And then maybe like an hour before the test, your completed paper is collected from you and you're informed about the mistakes that you were making. And then the paper is given back to you. So may you, you may correct it. This is exactly like that. This is how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by giving us all the details of what's going to happen, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to operate on the day of judgment. Now, if this at this point in time, you still can't do well, you have nobody to blame but yourself because everything was loud and clear. If you still end up in fire, it's surely not due to shortage of Allah's mercy. This is also Allah's mercy. In Surah Qalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Afa naj muslimina kal mujrimin? Then uh, will we treat the Muslims like the criminals? That's not going to happen. Uh, that would be zulm to treat them the same way because the consequences is explicitly laid out. And one person is trying very hard doing jihad in his life and the other person is you know he just shrugs his shoulders and he says like you know Allah didn't give me hidayah it's only fair to give what they each deserve this is because Allah is merciful but he's just as well right notice that Allah takes the responsibility of providing love upon himself I'm going to give you the love and all kinds of love keep in mind all all kinds of love not just Allah's love or creations people's love as well um, so responsibility of, of human is to believe and just do good deeds. That's it. This is all Allah wants from us. And as for the love and acceptance, leave that to Allah. Leave that to Allah. When Allah takes it upon himself to achieve love, you know, uh, when humans take it upon themselves to achieve love and acceptance, especially uh, from other people, it usually leads to an unhealthy compromise in your core principle because you're so desperate for people to accept you and people people to love you and this is called mudahana this is called mudahana where you're making a little bit of compromise you know cutting corners so that people would accept you and we all know how it operates we all know we are so desperate for uh, you know for the love uh, of people around us we want that acceptance and it's very natural to expect uh, this acceptance of people around you. But if you kind of focus on that and think that that's your responsibility or only you can do it, then you're just taking the thing for which Allah SWT has clearly claimed that, you know, he's going to take care of it. And that is exactly what the disbelievers want. They want you to cut corners. They want you to make compromises. They want, they love mudahana with Muslims. Surah Alam, mind you, was the second surah revealed, right? Um, and at that point, Prophet Sallallahu was warned that don't become someone who so easily compromise, who, uh, who, who so easily would compromise his deen. Sahabas would say that someone who nobody ever complains about, someone who tells people what they want to hear, this is a person who actually compromises in his religion. So if you have people making fun of you, objecting to what you think or do, this is a sunnah of Prophet So the path to love and acceptance of people is that a person does what is right. You stand your ground. And at times people might not like it,
but that person keeps doing what he's doing. We need to strongly believe that any kind of love, any kind of acceptance of people, it will only come to you with Allah's permission. So the first and the foremost thing is Iman and Amru Saleh. And as reward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you what? Universal love and acceptance. When? When it's best for, for that person. So Allah doesn't promise it immediately. He's going to give you that love. He's going to give you acceptance. Why am I saying universal? Because you can think of all the loves, Allah's and pre creation and people and all of that. Leave a Rahman's job for him and we do our job. That universal love and acceptance uh, from people and other, uh, other creation will come only and only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we can just kind of, I just love this ayah. It's so, so beautifully, uh, you know, talks about what we are supposed to do and what Allah, sub so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking responsibility for. Amazing. Ayah number 97. bilisanaka bash, bihil muttaqeen. So, oh, uh, so, oh, Muhammad, we have only made Quran easy through your tongue so that you may give good tidings thereby to the righteous and warn thereby hostile people. Achha. So, there is a pronoun coming here, yes, sir, nahu, who, uh, that we have made it easy. We have made it simple. Uh, this it is explicitly pointing to the Quran. Taisir uh, uh, is often translated as to make something easy. Yes, sir. Yusra. In the Usri Yusra. Yusra is what? That to make something really, really easy. But it's not actually a very, very accurate translation because it can create a little bit of confusion about the Quran. Because uh, we usually have this notion that anything and that is simple, anything that is easy, that doesn't require effort, that doesn't require you to, you know, budge sometimes. So it is important to understand in what sense is it easy? In what sense is Quran simple and easy? So that we don't undermine the fact that it still requires work. It requires a lot of work. You can put in 10 months, you know, and sometimes uh, you sit in front of an eye and you don't even know where to start from. So there have been people, uh, uh, scholars who have spent months over ayahs. So it still requires time. It requires patience. It requires work from a person. So let's not get, uh, you know, confused over here. So a more appropriate translation of uh, in Nama Yasar Nahu would be that we have no doubt facilitated it for you. We have given you the facilities that will allow you to engage with it the way you should be engaging. That is a more uh, appropriate uh, way of uh, addressing it. Bilisanaka, uh, uh, through your tongue. Now, primary means by which uh, we have facilitated it for you is by your tongue. But here, bilisanika is referring to uh, Arabic language meaning the language the Messenger وسلم, used to speak. That we know in Quranic language is, has got very, very rich vocabulary, right? So Lisan is more than just language. It is a level of um, communication that people can uh, understand and relate to. That is also uh, embedded in the word Lisanika. Uh, hence, to properly engage in the Quran or with the Quran, we first have to do what? Understand Arabic language. And, uh, you know, congratulations to our grammar students who are here in Tafsir men, uh, class as well. You're doing exactly what one should be doing. And I would very strongly recommend and encourage the rest of you to maybe consider taking grammar subject next time around whenever we offer the next uh, course, inshallah. So a great amount of, uh, we see a misunderstanding of Islam and Quran is mostly due to the wrong translation Muslims have done of the Quran. Now, at the same time, uh, we do need to understand Quran and then explain it in a way that people understand. So your level should be that you understand the language and go into the depths and treasures of each and every word. But when it comes to explaining to others, you do it in a very simple way, as simple as possible, 
um, to achieve an objective and what's the objective that people understand the Quran. That's the whole. Never think that it would make you uh, sound dumb if you explain a simple uh, concept to people, uh, you know, in a way that they understand. The Prophet ﷺ used to use language that was very, very easy, very easy to understand. Sometimes he would repeat uh, himself up to three times. He would never be concerned about trying to use fancy words or, you know, that wasn't the accomplishment, that wasn't the objective. The objective is helping someone understand what Allah is saying. And for this, I would like to make a small little request before I go to the last uh, verse. I would want all of you to give your feedback since we are completing the surah today. Um, I would really request all of you and the ones who are absent, uh, I would request the mentors to send a message to them. And we would like to have a feedback of uh, the tafsir that you have uh, attended with us of Surah Maryam so that we can improve ourselves and understand, you know, if we are uh, get the, the kind of uh, engagement that we try and keep in the class is are you benefiting from it or not so we would really like to hear from you uh, whatever uh, you know feedback you have to give inshallah ta'ala and it only inshallah help us to improve inshallah so why has the quran been facilitated by allah subhanahu ta'ala what is the reason well litu bash litu bashira bihil muttaqin so that you can inspire by means of it uh, good righteous people so you can further lift their spirits reinforce what they are already doing so it's not just for disbelievers it's even for the muslims the righteous pious people that they further enhance their level of taqwa and level of iman and all of that and along with that another reason is what that you can warn by it people who are extremely argumentative so first you motivate people and when that kind of doesn't work and you find out that you know they just want to get into rhetoric with you then at that point you warn them through the quran as well so first allah talks about motivating people and then he talks about warning people as well so this surah is the climax here you know it's just it's the second last ayah here that we're doing, uh, the second last, last ayah that we're doing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he talks about bad people who is being, uh, you know, punished in hellfire. But then Allah emphasizes to Prophet Sallallahu that the method of dawah is still the same. Motivate them. If that doesn't work, then warn them. It has to be same. Warning is not to scare, you know. It has to be done with uh, well wishes. It's a compassionate reminder. Dawah is not to put people into a, um, into a paralyzing fear where they're not able to move and act upon it. We might feel sometimes, uh, especially after uh, you know this command coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you have to kind of make sure that you are giving the good news to people and warning them. We feel that, no, 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 no I can't guide people. Surely mm -hmm. can't warn them. I can't do that. Uh, you don't know what I'm dealing with. These guys are going to butcher me if I'm going to go back to my circle and tell them, you know what, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. They, they, they will not spare me. Well, there were people who had opposed and oppressed Prophet ﷺ for 20 years. Right? And a very good example of that is of Khalid bin Walid. Khalid bin Walid was solely responsible for kill, killing of so many Muslims in battle of Ohad. And when Prophet ﷺ, he came across his brother. His brother's name was Walid bin Walid. He was Khalid bin Walid, and his brother's name was Walid bin Walid. So Prophet Sallallahu he said, how is Khalid? And he asked very sincerely. And even the brother was very surprised. And he said, why would you want to know about him? Why are you asking about him? And the messenger, he said, I've always admired his intelligence. So Walid, who was the brother, at that time, even he wasn't hopeful that you know, Khalid would ever become Muslim. But he was so inspired by the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uh, showed his love and sincerity that he wrote a letter to Khalid telling him what Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. And Khalid, he became Muslim. He became Muslim on that. Then there was a Sahabi, Abu Sufyan uh, tortured him so much, so badly that even Khalid, uh, before becoming Muslim, he went to Abu Sufyan. 
Yeah. And he said, uh, you know, he told him to back off. And the way Abu Sufyan treated a want to become Muslim, he recalled that I really wanted to become Muslim, the way he was torturing Abu Sufyan. Um, so it was uh, the Prophet's love that became the turning point for him. Then Ikrama ibn Abu Jahal. Ikrama was the son of Abu Jahal. He was also a, a staunch enemy of Muslims. Uh, he was, uh, he fought alongside his father, Abu Jahl, um, against the Muslims. After his father who died in battle of Badr, he kept fighting against Muslims. So when Prophet Sallallahu came to Makkah uh, at the time of conquest, he just ran away, Ikrama ran away. And the wife of Ikrama, he, she came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and saying that Ikrama ran thinking that he would never forgive him. And the Prophet said, no, 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 no. You can bring him back and I would, won't give him any trouble. And she went and brought him back from the port because he was about to board a ship. And when Prophet heard he's back, he turned to Sahaba and he very seriously told them that do not mention his father, talk against Ikrama's father in front of him. Right. So he, Ikrama became um, a Muslim. And of course, his father had died as a, as a kafir. So he said, just have respect. Don't say anything against him in front of Ikrama. And then we come to know that even Ikrama, he died as a shaheed fighting for Islam. SubhanAllah. Then um, Abu Sufyan, uh, Umar and other sahabas were about to pounce on him when he came into entered the tent at the time of conquest. Prophet Sallallahu told them, relax, back off. He's a leader of his people. Oh, where is your respect? He got upset with the Sahabas. And then Abu Sufyan, he requested for protection for his people and family and Prophet Sallallahu gave it. Hind, wife of Abu Sufyan, um, she paid Vashi, we all know the Qissa, she paid Vashi to kill Hamza, who was the Prophet's uh, uncle, right? She was welcomed by Prophet Sallallahu She accepts Islam and she becomes Hind Radhiyal Anha. Amazing, right? And Vashi, who had actually killed uh, uh, the messenger's uh, uncle, Hamza, Prophet, he wrote letter after left letter inviting him to, uh, to, to Islam. And when he came uh, to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's an incident that uh, narrates that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he looked at Vashi and he all of a sudden remembered his uncle and he started to cry. And he tells Vashi that, you know, uh, it makes him, you know, he just made him remember his uncle and that he's still a human being. He can't help it. So this is the kind of compassion Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had for people who were deadly against him. But when he, they repented, they wanted to enter into Islam. This is how he welcomed all of them. Now, I know there is a question here. Uh, and the question is that didn't Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, pray against some of the disbelievers? Didn't he punish any of them? Didn't Nuh alayhi salam ask Allah to destroy his people? Didn't, didn't they do that? Yes, they did. But look at the key people among his enemies and how he embraced them, right? So when we try to adopt these standards, our first step must be tabshir. We must motivate people. It is the first, uh, it's first the good news and then the warning. Right, so you give uh, good tidings and later warning with it. Now both the things are used with be he. Uh, you give good tidings with it, and you give warning with it. The question is with what? What do you do? What do you give good tidings with? And what, how do you warn people with? What do you uh, warn them with? The Quran. The Quran. We must. Uh, motivate and warn using the Quran. Quran is should be a primary vehicle of dawa, whether it's a, a tabshir or a nazir state. In, in both cases, tragedy of our community is that our dawa is based on just about everything. And when I say dawa, I'm talking about advising people, counseling people, you know, uh, correcting them. We use all kinds of uh, uh, resources other than the Quran. We need to explain the Quran to people, even if it is a single verse. You don't have to go cover to cover 10,000 times for explaining one verse that has touched your heart. 
go and put your hissa in it. Because this is a command, not just for Prophet Sallallahu it is for us as well. Ayah number 98. And how many have we destroyed before them of generations? Do you perceive of them anyone or hear from them a sound? So, hal uh, um, to Have you come to realize or know anything about these people? No, that's the whole point. They were wiped clean off the face of the earth. If Quran had mentioned these nations and how Allah destroyed them, we wouldn't have known about them. We wouldn't have known. It is Quran that's telling them this. That's how completely wiped off they are from the face of the earth. Or do you hear even a light sound? Uh, do you hear even a light sound from them? Rix is a very, very light sound. And the word, this particular word is also used for the buzzing of the bee. So it is as if, you know, they didn't even exist. Allah has dealt with many people like that before. He's surely capable of dealing with us like that too if we don't take the warning. No one even knows about these people. But Allah na kare, we might be of those people that nobody would know if we don't take the warning. Beautiful, very, very powerful surah. And I would like to end this surah with a poem. And this poem is about uh, the life in this dunya. And then I want you to share with you all, uh, you know, as, uh, as a conclusion as a conclusion of this surah. So this is how it goes. Your life is just nothing but breaths that are being counted individually. So that each and every single time a breath passes you by, a part of your life has passed you by. How can a young man enjoy the life and pleasures of this world when in reality, every breath he takes is being counted against him. And this is taking away from what he knows to be his life. That day is coming when we will gather the good people in delegations, convoys, and envoys. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, unite us with these people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to internalize these pow powerful surahs of the Quran going through just one surah of the quran don't you feel more empowered don't you feel more enlightened yeah how will we ever going to justify any kind of confusion that we have our misunderstanding about the deal about deen, our, our wrong notions of how to please Allah subhanahu wa how will we ever stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and claim his ayahs to be unclear after going through this amazing what he expects from us? Allahumma hasibni hisabi yaseera. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.